This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the very niche and kind of geeky details of modern warfare with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to Elizabeth Serkov. She's a researcher and writer with a big network of people she speaks to across Syria and has been for a long time. She's going to be speaking about how the Free Syrian Army's rebellion against the Assad regime failed, more specifically how it was crushed by various different actors and situations in the region. If you like what we're doing at Popular Front, you want to see it keep moving forward, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash popular front. This is completely independent, so it all helps, even one dollar. So I thought what might be most useful uh, maybe is for you to go back into the history a little bit. You know, how did the Syrian revolution start? How did the war, you know, how did it turn from this street movement into a war? Because I think a lot of people have kind of forgotten because, you know, the war has been going on so long now. The civil war uh, that is raging now in Syria, what could even be termed as a proxy war, an international war, uh, started as just uh, another uprising in the uprisings of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, so uh, protests erupted in Dara and in Damascus in uh, March 2011 and quickly spread to other uh, cities uh, and towns across, uh, across Syria. Um, Syrian uh, demographics are uh, complicated and um, the the ruling regime is dominated by the Alawi sect and uh, members of other minority communities um, such as Christians and Druze um, often uh, benefit for the regime from the regime or at least feel protected by it to some extent and uh, the majority of the population is uh, Sunni Muslim Arab uh, they're, they're about 65% uh, of the population. And uh, that population faces uh, and faced uh, discrimination. Um, you know, the best jobs, the best positions would be given to people close to the regime, members of the Alawi sect, even members of the, of the, of the Assad family and uh, the kind of tribal uh, uh, group to which he belongs. Um, and, and therefore, it was no surprise that the majority of protesters uh, were also uh, Sunni Arab, not exclusively. Uh, Alawis and Druze and Christians and uh, atheists, Ismailis, uh, Turkmen, Kurds also participated in the protests, but the majority of them were uh, Sunni Arab. Um, and the regime um, utilized that and uh, exploited the uh, kind of uh, Islamophobic tropes, uh, just straight up lied and said, you know, these people are terrorists, they are uh, extremists, they uh, want to destroy the country. Um, so uh, the regime used uh, overwhelming force against protesters that were initially uh, absolutely peaceful. You know, there would be occasional rock throwing. Yeah, like uh, small clashes. Yeah, exactly. So in initially it it was, you know, largely kind of a, like a, a popular uprising. And this was uh, when, sorry, what was this, 2011? That was 2011. And then, uh, so the uprising started in March, uh, and then in, uh, in June, there were the first signs that some people were taking up arms, initially to uh, attack regime checkpoints and prote protect protesters. So they would form kind of cordons around protesters to allow them to, uh, to exercise, you know, the right to, to free speech without being attacked by regime uh, militias uh, known as the Shabiha um, and the regime's military. Initially, the response was uh, of the regime was, you know, live ammunition, light weapons, arrest, torture. Uh, thousands upon thousands of people were arrested at the time. Um, and, and later, the regime escalated the violence. Uh, in 2012, it began using artillery. Uh, it uh, would besiege towns, it besieged Dara, it besieged uh, uh, the, the city of Homs, basically the neighborhoods there that fell out of uh, regime control. And then escalated further uh, in uh, April 2012, began using uh, the Air Force initially against military targets, then also against civilian targets. 
um, began using Scud missiles, then began using chemical weapons against, um, initially against military targets, against rebels, then began using it uh, also against population centers. Every time the regime tested uh, the boundaries, what it can get away with, it saw that there is no international response, so it escalated the violence. And uh, the opposition armed itself. Uh, initially, it was extremely disorganized. You know, over a thousand groups popped up. Uh, initially, those groups were largely kind of nationalist and lacking any kind of clear ideology other than the desire to topple the regime. Uh, then the sources of finance uh, and um, processes of radicalization within the population that was subjected to such brutal violence by the regime. You know, thousands of people, uh, uh, thousands of people were being killed. Um, people were witnessing horrors around them, and that naturally uh, led some people to cling to their faith and to their identity, to their sectarian identity. Um, so, uh, and in addition to that, uh, financing by uh, private donors from the Gulf and later uh, state donors uh, in the Gulf. Uh, kind of further radicalized uh, the opposition. So from a kind of a nationalist uprising using national symbols and the, and the nationalist flag, uh, we saw, you know, groups adopting more uh, Islamic sounding names. Um, and the uh, protests that uh, initially were very clearly anti-sectarian, so there would be chants about national unity and rejections of sectarianism, uh, over time, in you know, 2012, 2013, um, you saw those kinds of uh, chants being abandoned and instead uh, rebel groups adopting a very sectarian rhetoric. And obviously with the rise of, uh, you know, ultra extremist groups such as uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, the Al-Qaeda affiliate in, in Syria, and then uh, ISIS, they were kind of the um, the result of this radicalization uh, process uh, of the opposition, in addition to the entry of foreign fighters uh, through Iraq and through uh, mostly Turkey. Um, and that also kind of pushed the, the opposition uh, into kind of an ex extremist direction. If we scale back a little bit, at which point did the opposition turn into, you know, the FSA, the Free Syrian Army. I remember vaguely starting to hear, you know, moderate rebels, and then it was the Free Syrian Army, and they went from kind of very ragtag to actual brigades. Right, so in uh, immediately after uh, the revolution became uh, armed, um, basically officers who defected from uh, Assad's uh, military began using the moniker the Free Syrian Army. Uh, and uh, basically you would see groups from all over the country adopting that name. But in reality, there was no coordination between these different groups. And such coordination only emerged, uh, there were efforts to unify the rebels throughout 2013, but the proper kind of unification of the Free Syrian Army actually occurred in late 2013 and even 2014 uh, when the United States, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, Jordan established uh, basically the operation rooms um, in Amman uh, and in, in Ankara basically to manage uh, the, the Free Syrian Army and to manage the flow of weaponry to these vetted groups, uh, both in northern um, Syria and, and in, the south, in the south. So they kind of coalesced at that point? Yes, they, they coalesced at that point, but the, the, and, you know, nominally the leadership uh, of the groups was Syrian, right? So in the south, for example, the groups were unified under the name the Southern Front, and the Southern Front had its leadership. But decision-making power was not in the hands of Syrians. It was in the hand of, of, of these operations room that were run by the CIA and other uh, intelligence services. So at no point did the Free Syrian Army cohere into a single, uh, into even a conglomerate of groups under a unified leadership that is Syrian. When the unified leadership did emerge, it was not Syrian. Right, yeah. So how did the CIA, you know, America was involved, obviously, you know, it's not conspiracy thing. They were openly involved with the train and equip programs because they wanted Assad to fall. How did they, 
well, at least from my perspective, it seems they messed that up in an incredibly huge way. You know what I mean? Like, how did that happen? Because you had the FSA kind of there, and then it just it just seemed to just turn into nothing after a while. Right. So there were um, two programs run by the United States, one run by the CIA, uh, which I mentioned previously, and then there was also the train and equip. So I'll, I'll discuss. I'll discuss both. Um, the the CIA uh, program, uh, known as Timber Sycamore, that's the the code name. Um, that program basically came into effect at a point where the opposition in Syria was already dominated by Salafi and even jihadist actors. So uh, when the uprising was uh, militarizing, you know, revolutionaries, right, were taking up arms uh, and they had no Islamist ideology, um, uh, the United States was not interested in supporting them. Uh, the Obama administration refused, you know, at this point in, you know, 2012, please by the opposition to provide them with support. And you would see massive protests happening in Syria with requests for support uh, for the Free Syrian Army. And obviously there was uh, diplomacy behind the stage, uh, beh uh, behind the curtain, you know, people would would ask for the support. And the United States consistently refused to, to offer the support. So they were too late, basically. They were far too late, even when they went exactly. in to help. By the, by the time that they started offering the support in 2013, 2014, the opposition is already already moved to a much more radical direction. And the support that was offered at the time was both limited and in a way um, not intended to allow the, the Frisian army or the opposition to topple the Assad regime. At this point, because the opposition was so radical, um, the, the Obama administration feared a situation in which the rebels advance, you know, take over Damascus, take over the Halloween areas and, and basically commence a uh, mass slaughter of, of members of minority communities. So the idea at this point of, of the uh, Timber Sycamore program, uh, the, the objectives were twofold. The first one was uh, to support the opposition to such an extent that would pressure the Assad regime to seriously negotiate its departure so that the departure is orderly and there's no collapse of state institutions, there's no situ there's no opportunity for rebels to barge into minority areas and slaughter people there. Um, and, and the second purpose of the program was actually to um, basically get uh, Qatar and get Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, and, and, and Kuwait uh, that were supporting uh, the opposition at the time to basically oversee their um, their flow of weapons to the to the opposition, uh, and in particularly uh, the CIA wanted to supervise that transfer of weaponry to prevent the entry of man pads of of uh, you know uh, uh, surface to air missiles. Uh, uh, the, the Obama administration was determined to prevent the entry of these weapons into Syria after they had the experience of flooding Afghanistan with these weapons and then, you know, spending decades chasing around these man pads, collecting them to ensure that they're not used to uh, target civilian airlines or, you know, friendly, um, friendly jets. Um, so, so the the purpose of engaging basically Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the other and the other countries in Turkey um, was uh, also to control what they are allowed basically to distribute to to these groups. So the CIA program never intended actually to to topple the Assad regime to provide the opposition with enough support to allow them uh, to overthrow uh, Assad. Um, and then there was the train and equip program which was run by the Pentagon. Uh, that program uh, was an even bigger failure um, because the, the program was aimed at countering ISIS, while the main uh, threat uh, and the main opponent of the Syrian opposition is the Assad regime. The Assad regime uh, is responsible for 90% of civilian casualties in Syria. Obviously, they have a problem with ISIS. Many of them were expelled from their homes because of ISIS, particularly people from the Rizor and Raqqa. Uh, but they see their main opponent as the Assad regime. They are willing to fight ISIS, but not exclusively. And the train and equip program specifically, uh, the people who were uh, selected for the training, uh, which, uh, you know, was to be conducted in Turkey, and it was conducted in Turkey uh, and in Jordan, uh, 
the rebels who were selected for the program were specifically ta- were specifically asked to sign basically a document saying that they will not fight the Assad regime and that they will only use the weapons that they've been given and the training they've been given to fight ISIS. And this is unacceptable to, or at least it was unacceptable to um, to most rebels at the time. And as there's and and in addition to that, the um, the the program was carried out at a time when. Um, basically, these forces that were trained were injected back into uh, northern Syria. Um, you know, as this kind of counter extremism force, not an anti regime force, um, and and they were perceived as a threat uh, by Jabhat al Nusra. Um, and basically, Jabhat al Nusra attacked them to confiscated their weapons. Um, so. Uh, the train and equip uh, program really didn't go anywhere except for uh, a small contingent of fighters that is still present in Atanf in the border triangle of uh, Jordan, Iraq, and and Syria. Uh, The the rebel groups that were trained uh, in in that part of the uh, Pentagon's program are still operational and are still, uh, you know, allowing the, the U.S. to maintain uh, control uh, of this area of this uh, strategic uh, border triangle. That's uh, Al Tanf, right? Right. But that's like a joke. Like you know, it's like I mean, they're there, but they're not doing anything. They're not can't really stop anything. They kind of just have to allow the Americans, right? Yeah, uh, pretty much. So they're kind of a partner force of the United States. But the reason that the regime is not advancing on the territory is because of the presence of U.S. forces there who. Uh, and previous attempts of the regime and Iranian militias to advance uh, in this territory faced, you know, uh, basically American airstrikes, uh, etc. So, so they are not a significant force. Their efforts, uh, for example, to launch an operation deeper into the resort was absolutely unsuccessful. So, so they are not uh, kind of a, a major force, but they're they're pretty much the only uh, the only uh, force that was trained in the in the US train and equip program that was aimed at uh, Arab uh, Sunni rebels as opposed to Kurds uh, that is still uh, operational in any kind of way maybe you can go into a little bit more detail about how these kind of disparate FSA brigades ended up becoming these you know or maybe not becoming but ended up being kind of overrun by these jihadist groups because the revolution started in 2011 within two or three years there were jihadists everywhere. Like, how did that happen? If these the FSA fighters were so secular, and I'm not saying they weren't, I've certainly met some of them and I, I know that it's true, they were definitely secular, a lot of them. But how did they kind of, you know, get overrun by these jihadists? Um, so I think there are multiple factors at play here. Um, one thing is that um, jihadist rebels had a lot more uh, ex- experience fighting guerrilla warfare than uh, these FSA groups that popped up. Uh, basically, uh, a lot of them had experience fighting the U.S. occupation in, in Iraq, and they brought over these skills, you know, how to uh, build VBIDs, how to, uh, how to assemble, you know, IDs placed on roads, etc., um, and how to operate in kind of small secretive units. Uh, so, so those are skills that the FSA uh, lacked. In addition... Um, the more extremist groups, uh, because they uh, were better supported by foreign donors at the time, there was basically, um, you know, in 2012 and early 2013, there wasn't major state support. It was uh, basically private networks uh, of uh, Salafi financiers from the Gulf. And they naturally supported groups that were more radical, that were more in line with their ideology. So I personally know of people who fought in Syria, who fought in Free Syrian Army groups. They were receiving no salaries. They had, you know, 10 bullets and an old, an old AK-47. And then they were, you know, they heard about this opportunity to go and actually earn a salary and not be limited to 10 bullets, uh, but, you know, actually be able to fight in a, in a, in a, in a fighting force that is effective and it takes on the regime and, and wins battles. And it was tempting for them. So, so they left, you know, even though they are quite secular. Um, and I know this uh, because I interacted with them, you know, for many years. Uh, I know how they 
uh, interact with me as a woman uh, who is uh, Jewish and Israeli, they, they, they are absolutely um, not extremists, but they want to fight for an effective force. Um, so uh, th there are people who joined uh, groups for, for this reason. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, I think there is something about um, jihadist groups that makes them... Uh, they they invest more in their fighters in the sense of um, uh, indoctrinating them, um, creating kind of unit unit cohesion. Um, it's much more of a an ideological project than FSA groups that were often just basically uh, the male members of a family that lives in a certain village. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of natural that a group that is more ideologically committed, more organized, uh, that has kind of a clear ideology and invests in, in, uh, in training and indoctrinating its fighters, uh, would have, uh, better success. Yeah. Like it's, it's a lot easier to get someone invested in this kind of, you know, hardline Islamic death cult basically than it is to say, hey, we're going to fight the government because we don't like this and this, you don't like this. And you know what I mean? It's a very clear path with the jihadism. Yeah. And and in addition, um, Free Syrian Army groups um, uh, in 2012 uh, started suffering kind of reputational damage due to the corruption of some commanders, you know, people who basically adopted the name FSA, but in reality were, you know, kind of gangs that were running around looting, while jihadists had a better reputation at the time. Um, so, so people who wanted to join a group that had a better reputation also joined kind of the, the, the jihadist groups. In addition, some of the fighting tactics of the jihadist groups, like, for example, the use of, of suicide bombings, um, that uh, other groups, uh, Free Syrian Army groups, never use suicide bombings. And there isn't a single recorded instance of them using it. Um, uh, this is something that also makes uh, jihadist groups much more effective at breaking down fortifications. So even if um, several groups uh, launch an offensive together, you would need to have the jihadist on board to, to do those initial SVBID attacks to break down, uh, you know, regime uh, defenses. Um, um, so uh, th those are some, some of the reasons why these groups were more effective. Another reason was, um, and this concerns ISIS uh, specifically, was basically the regime's decision um, after ISIS was established in 2013 not to target the group. Um, the, the regime would uh, continue fighting and bombing, uh, you know, free Syrian army groups and Salafi uh, Syrian groups, but ISIS was kept alone. Uh, the regime did not bomb them uh, in any kind of major way. Why? Uh, because it was a very useful opponent um, uh, for the regime. Basically, the regime wanted to present to the international community, uh, the, uh, it's, it's either me or these jihadists. So it would uh, bomb the rebels quite ferociously, but ISIS areas were left alone to the point where uh, personal contacts of mine would leave areas under rebel control to go live in under ISIS control because they said it's safer. I can conduct business here uh, in in rebel held areas. There are constantly bombings. There's it's I mean it's impossible. You stock your your shop and the next day everything is gone. So it's like better the devil you know basically at that stage. Yeah, and I mean the the ISIS areas uh, until they basically barged into Iraq in uh, mid two thousand fourteen. And then, you know, uh, genocided the Yazidis and beheaded uh, a few Americans. Uh, they were being left alone. So the areas were indeed uh, much, much safer than uh, rebel-held territory. And, and Russia, too, by the way, when it intervened in Syria in September 2015, it claimed that it is doing so to fight terrorism. But the overwhelming majority of strikes that it carried out are in areas that were rebel control. Um, so uh, that also obviously helped uh, ISIS uh, and the fact that, you know, during the first year and a few months after their emergence, they were basically not getting bombed. Obviously, that is uh, very helpful when you uh, seek to uh, gain territory um, from uh, both rebels and the regime. Right. Um, so what I want to ask now is, you know, what what is 
Is is there any FSA left? You know, because I hear people talking about oh the FSA and Afrin. Now in jail, I met some FSA who basically in 2015 had left Syria and were like, we're done, it's over for us, you know. And they were good people and they were definitely secular, 100%, you know. And when I see these criminals in Afrin looting, you know, and basking in it, like, you know, openly looting, that they shot a woman the other day in broad daylight in front of children, that to me is not the FSA that I thought I knew. You know what I'm saying? So so do you think there is really any FSA left? I definitely uh, don't think that um, uh, the... FSA, the way it was uh, constituted uh, in 2011, 12, uh, 13, 14, still exists in Syria. Um, the uh, area of southern Syria uh, that was uh, recaptured by the regime in uh, uh, June and July of uh, 2018 was still controlled, uh, well, before the takeover, was controlled uh, largely by the southern front. Uh, as I mentioned, supported uh, until um, 2018 by the uh, mock room, the CIA-run room uh, from Amman. Uh, those groups um, in the south uh, were basically ordered not to fight the regime since 2015 um, and uh, concentrated on fighting ISIS in the area, ISIS in the uh, along the occupied Golan and Jordan, that border triangle. Um, so, uh, uh, and in um, areas uh, uh, in Idlib now, we have uh, basically uh, the all groups uh, pretty much that are not Hayat Tahrir Sham, which is the current reincarnation of Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, have unified into a single force uh, that is very much under Turkish influence. Um, and then uh, we have the Euphrates Shield factions or the factions that participated in the operation to uh, capture Efrin uh, from the YPG and YPG. Um, and those forces are directly controlled by uh, Turkey. You know, they're receiving their salaries in Turkish lira. Yeah, they have Turkish flags up in the streets of Afrin, like, you know, it's, it's, it's the joke is TFSA, right? Turkish Free Syrian Army. Right, exactly. Um, so I, I would say that um, uh, pretty much around 2015, 2016, is when uh, there were still Free Syrian Army groups, both in Idlib and in, uh, in Dara'a, in Qunetra, um, uh, and then Homs a little bit, but they... Um, largely uh, stop being actors that can make decisions on their own. Uh, they became very much in Idlib, uh, basically operating under dominance of more radical factions. So they cannot carry out operations on their own. They basically uh, need to um, oftentimes bribe um, Jabhat al-Nusra at the time, now Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, to be allowed to operate by providing them a share of the weapons that they were receiving uh, through the CIA-run room. And in southern Syria, they were basically ordered not to fight the, the regime and fight ISIS instead. Um, and and the, the, basically, currently, the only uh, uh, group that uh, kind of officially, uh, the only groups that kind of officially use the the, the name, the Frisian army, uh, are uh, either very much directly uh, are, you know, essentially Turkish mercenaries uh, operating in a way that is um, intended to serve Turkish interests and not necessarily the interests of uh, the uprising, the way it was, you know, the way it, it started, you know, the uprising against the Assad regime. But these uh, Euphrates Shields factions have never fought the Assad regime. Um, and then the groups, the group operating uh, in, 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 in the Idlib, um, they are under significant Turkish influence and they basically participate in fighting uh, when the Turks tell them to and don't do anything when the Turks tell them not to. But they are such a, a weak force at this point because the area is dominated by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham that it's 
uh, almost even pointless to to talk about them. Yeah, exactly, right? Like HTS is such a powerful force. Yes, they're jihadists. Yes, they're, you know, basically Al-Qaeda extraction, but they are a lot tougher than any of those groups around there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, unfortunately for the... Um, for, for the three million, million civilians who live in Idlib and Hama and Aleppo, the area is now utterly dominated by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. So is it safe to say then that, you know, it seems obvious the, the revolution, the uprising is well and truly dead? Well, I mean, I, I think as, um, as, as, I mean, re a revolution, you know, um, uh, a friend of mine, um, uh, Raed Faris, he was an activist in Idlib, he was murdered uh, by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. Uh, he said that, you know, the revolution is an idea and an idea cannot be killed. Um, so I think the revolutionary idea is still very much alive in the minds of Syrians, both in Syria and abroad. Uh, but the revolution as a social movement and uh, as a, uh, an armed movement uh, is to to a large extent uh, destroyed. It sounds to me as well, when you're talking about this CIA situation, it sounds to me like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the CIA basically tried to use the FSA. So the, the basically the, the, the Pentagon tried to use um, the, the FSA to fight ISIS and was largely unsuccessful uh, in getting them to do so. Um, with the CIA, I think uh, they try to use the the rebels to uh, achieve a strategy that was ill-conceived from the very get-go. The Assad regime uh, was never going to agree to negotiate with the opposition. Uh, it said so from day one. Um, even when it was really reduced to controlling about 20% of Syrian territory, it was never willing to negotiate. It was never willing to accede to any of the demands of the opposition, even even the smallest ones. It's it's a regime that is um, that um, even if initially uh, in 2011 had some more pragmatic members, they absolutely lost any kind of influence within the decision making uh, process and circle. And basically, the most hardline individuals who support mass murder of of civilians, of opponents. Uh, I mean, um, th they're the ones who uh, are, are in charge. Uh, they are the ones who are advising Assad. Uh, they are the ones who uh, conceived of strategies of, you know, besieging entire towns and starving people to death of you know, bombardment of population centers, of uh, what the UN has called mass extermination in, in Syrian prisons. Um, so, so this regime was never willing to, to negotiate its departure or even any kind of reforms that would uh, weaken its power. And, and the insistence of international powers and the UN that this regime can be uh, negotiated uh, with and could be compelled to to leave power or uh, share power is just delusional. There's nothing about the conduct of this regime that is that should give people any uh, kind of hope that it is uh, a negotiating partner, a serious negotiating partner. Right. Well, you, you can't like if you like you just said if you look at what you know, Assad has done to his own people and what he's done to Syria, you can't really negotiate with, you know, it's, it's, it's complete, he's a complete authoritarian war criminal. But it does look like, unfortunately, he's he's going to win this war. I mean, what do you think? No, I, I, I mean, it's definitely uh, clear that the Assad regime uh, is going to win this war. I mean, it, it has won the war. It, it just, it's a matter of, how much of, Syri of Syria's territory it will have under its control once, uh, you know, things settle down and there's some kind of an agreement. I think what the regime has been particularly effective in is uh, breaking the spirit of Syrians who oppose the regime, who do not wish to live under it, who came out into the streets uh, in 2011 and 12 uh, or supported people going out into the streets 
um, who had hopes uh, that they could live in a country that is different from the one they were raised in, that they could live in a country where they would not need to constantly fear surveillance, uh, and a, a society that was really, autom- you know, uh, broken down, atomized, basically, um, because no one could trust each other. So in 2011 and 12, and, and in subsequent years as well, we saw this kind of solidarity and people trusting each other and people working each other and uh, all sorts of uh, v- spontaneous kind of volunteer uh, local coordination committees and or, uh, small organizations and activist collectives. And what the regime has been able to do is get people who had hopes for their future and who wanted their children to grow up in a, in a better country uh, to give up that hope. Um, there are now millions of people living under regime control who hate the regime, but they are silent. They are terrified. They've been, uh, you know, uh, when protesters emerged into the streets in 2011, they would say, we broke the barrier of fear, you know, and, and now this, this wall of fear has been reestablished. And I know this uh, personally because I'm still in communication with people in areas that were once under rebel control and, and now they are under regime control and they are terrified. They are scared of their shadow. Of, of what are they saying though? Like specifically, what are the dangers they're facing? So uh, men face, uh, you know, uh, conscription into military service, both uh, regular service and as reserve. Um, but they are constantly afraid that they will be taken uh, by the secret police uh, if they are perceived to be supporters of the opposition. Uh, so this is why you see so many rebels, for example, joining regime militias. Some of them are doing it for the salary because there's, the economy is destroyed. There's no other way to make a living. But a lot of them are doing it as a way to signal to the regime that they are loyal in the hope that this will prevent them from being arrested and tortured. Um, so, so there is there is constant fear. The the Syria of, of uh, areas that have been recaptured by the regime are now living uh, through something that is way worse than what they experienced before 2011. Because before 2011, it was you know a, a complete dictatorship, but at least the regime, uh, even if it knew that many of the people in the population are hostile towards it because it operated, you know, secret police and they would talk to people and they would try to gauge people's views on the regime. Now the regime knows that these people hate, hate it. You know, they revolted against it. The regime lost control of these territories. And so, so it's harder to pretend, you know, that these people are, um, are not regime opponents. Uh, and, and the regime, uh, you know, distrust these communities uh, that uh, the rebels uh, took control over. And even though the revolutionary actors, you know, rebels and activists have been largely displaced to the north, to to Idlib and to the areas under direct Turkish control, uh, the people who stayed behind, they're not fans of the regime either. And the regime knows it. So there are daily arrests happening all over these territories. And people know what happens in detention because all of them lost family members who've been taken away and, you know, returned with, uh, you know, brutalized corpses or, you know, they were told that the the person, you know, a a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old had a heart attack in prison. They know what it means. They know what happens there. So there is constant fear. Uh, And many people would leave the country if they had the opportunity, but the borders are closed. So they are basically trapped in these uh, areas. Yeah, it's grim. I tell you what, this is why it really annoys me when you get these kind of, you know, these just children, these kind of babies like Max Blumenthal and Ben Norton, you know, absolute lunatics claiming to be leftists and pro-Assad. And it's like, that is a totalitarian state, no matter which way you look at it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, to be honest, even if a person is a leftist, I mean, I think uh, I would define myself as a leftist. That that would in- include support, for example, for labor rights and uh uh, the rights of the underclass of the, uh, and, and, and that class in Syria is the one that revolted against the regime. It's not the rich kids, uh, who came out into the streets, the people who benefited from the regime's, uh, neoliberal policies. It's the, the subaltern, right? The, the laborers, the farmers who came out uh, to the streets to protest. So I think, uh, leftists of all people, 
should have been supportive uh, of, of the uprising. I, I completely understand uh, the disgust that people feel about uh, radical groups. Um, uh, obviously, they are uh, oppressive, they are anti-left, uh, um, they are anti-human uh, rights, anti-women's rights, um, but the initial uprising was very much the result of uh, could be could be described as a class struggle essentially. Um, um, is there anything you want to add? Because I think we should, I don't know I think we pretty much got it. Yeah, I think I, I would I would just like to maybe a, a, a explain to to the listeners the kind of uh, lived experience of of Syrians in the country right now. Uh, and I say this basically on on a large network of of, of contacts that I've had in Syria, and even before the uprising. Um, I, I talk to people daily uh, across the country, and there is uh, a, a great sense of uh, hopelessness and helplessness. Um, people really feel not only abandoned by the international community, but also as um, basically um, soldiers in a game played by others, you know, little chess pieces. And, and I think um, that if uh, borders, the, the serious borders were opened up right now and people were allowed to leave, uh, millions of Syrians would flee the country. They are really, really tired of the war. They are, they hate all armed factions operating in it. Um, they, they just want to leave, leave and then live in peace. Um, and the, the fact that um, the, the fate of Idlib remains unresolved, the fact that three million people are living there in a territory that at any point can face the onslaught of the regime in Russia is, is deeply concerning. And um, uh, we can say that, you know, that Assad won the war, but this parcel of land is still, its fate is still unclear. And the people there are terrified and desperate to, to leave. Uh, and Turkey has no intention of, of allowing these individuals to leave. And I just hope, you know, uh, I know that a lot of your listeners uh, follow Syria uh, often through, uh, you know, looking at um, how uh, maps change and, you know, territory changes hands and the cool kind of inventions of modern warfare of like, the new designs of VBIDs and stuff like that. And that's, that's interesting and, and, and definitely deserves attention. But at the end of the day, we're talking about a, a country that is destroyed, a, a society that is destroyed, and millions of people whose daily existence is suffering. They wake up in the morning and they're suffering. They're suffering because they are afraid because they live in regime territory and they're afraid that they may be arrested at any moment. Uh, they are suffering because they lost their relatives, they lost their friends, and they're still mourning them and they're still processing that pain. And, and they are suffering because they live in an area that is under constant airstrikes um, or shelling, such as Idlib, or because they are living in an area without security, uh, because rebel groups are running around kidnapping people left and right, like in the Frin and like in uh, the Euphrates Shield area. And I think it is very easy when you don't interact with these people um, when research is conducted kind of uh, from afar and, and, and through these kind of military lenses to, to forget the immense human cost, the immense cost that Syrians are, are paying and will continue to pay uh, for, you know, go, for daring, you know, to dream uh, that their country can have a better future and that they can live in a country that is free of oppression. Uh, and I think all of us need to be to to be mindful of that when we're talking about Syria, to be uh, mindful of, of of that of that suffering and, and and just the enormity of the tragedy. Definitely, I mean it's it's the most grim situation certainly war wise in in my life. You know, I'm 29. I've never we've never seen anything like this. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It it, it really is, and and I think that uh, you know this is something I I often tell uh, people who just, you know, ask me, you know, for like a quick update, what, what's happening in Syria? And I tell them, you know, the, 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 there's a, something really good about Islam is the fact that it prohibits suicide. Because I think that if there wasn't this prohibition, 
you would see many Syrians just due to their desperation, due to their sense of helplessness and hopelessness, killing themselves. And I've had conversations with so many Syrians who are, are saying, you know, I, I wish I could end this all, uh, but I'm not doing this because this is prohibited in Islam. So just think about a, a country. Sure, there are people who can live a normal life. You know, Damascus is pretty normal. There are people who are profiting immensely from this war. But then the reality of millions of people is, is, is that desperation, is that uh, suffering, is living in, in just absolutely horrid conditions and ab abject poverty in camps, you know, they get flooded every winter. Uh, and, and I think it's just, it's so important to, to, to be mindful uh, of, of, this, of this human cost of, of, this, of this conflict. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um... Where can uh, people follow your work? Because I think what you're doing is really important. I think that's a really good point you've made. You know, if people want to contact you and keep up to date with what you're doing, where can they do that? Uh, I'm a research fellow at uh, the Forum for Regional Thinking. Uh, it's a think tank, uh, an Israeli-Palestinian think tank best based in Jerusalem. I'm uh, currently based in D.C. Um, they, uh, so they can search for the Forum for Regional Thinking and find my stuff on the website of the think tank, but also follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's E L I Z R A L, El Israel. It's like a combination uh, of uh, my um, uh, previous country of residence and my name. Uh, I bet I bet you've got some funny uh, looks from that when you tell people in the Middle East. Huh? Yeah, I mean it's it's been interesting. I I I, I just came back from Iraq. I did uh, some field work there. Uh, and people are just incredibly friendly. You know, I, I would tell people I'm from Israel and they were totally fine with it. And, you know, with all the Syrians with whom I speak, all of them know that I'm Israeli, uh, that I have, you know, Israeli citizenship uh, and currently reside in the U.S. Um, you know, some people uh, refuse to talk to me because of that, but there are actually very few such people. Um, Syrians you know, when they sense that someone cares about what is happening in their country and invested an effort in, you know, uh, learning about their country's history and its culture and its people, uh, they are uh, interested in talking. Uh, and that applies to both uh, supporters of the uh, uprising, uh, people who hate uh, everyone, which I think is now the majority of Syrians, and people who are uh, even uh, supporters of the regime or prefer the regime uh, over the terrible alternatives. Okay, Elizabeth, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. I learned a lot. Uh, it's my pleasure. That was Elizabeth Tserkov talking about how the Free Syrian Army's rebellion was crushed by the Assad regime, by bad management from the US, ISIS, all sorts. If you like what we're doing here at Popular Front and you want more, go to patreon.com slash popular front. For a very small price each month, you can get bonus episodes, access to the Discord community, which is banging. Um, all sorts going on there, patreon.com slash popular front. This episode was sponsored by the defensepost.com, defense with an S. Go there for daily updates, reportage, all sorts on the world in conflict. If you subscribe to us and hit the bell on YouTube, we have a documentary, a new one, a lot longer this time, coming out by the end of the month. That will be Anako Kiev. So if you go to youtube.com slash popular front, subscribe, hit the bell, blah, blah. Uh, follow us on Instagram, instagram.com slash popular dot front or Twitter. Uh, follow me. That's Jake underscore Hanrahan, H-A-N-I-H-A-N or at Popular Front CO, either of those. Thank you very much to the following people. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. Thank you to Adam Berg Snyder, Axel Iverson, Chad Walker, Dan Dunham, Daniel Shearer, Darby, Diana Gorvanek, Emily Molly, Fletcher Tate, Jack Mayhoff, very clever mate, you're hilarious. Uh, James from the Discord, Joanne Stocker, Joel Tambusi, Joshua Yabbott, uh, Lawrence Abrahams, LH, Margaret Bowling, Michael Euler, Patrick Bronte, Peter McCormack at What Bitcoin Did, Rasha Al Akidi, Ryan Sandercock, Scartoon Music, Scott Jonesy, Sean Fowler, Sebastian from the Discord, Sarushe Hawazi, Teddy, Tom Lochrin, Tony Bin, Vida Provost, and Zachary Hinch. Thank you very much. 
music in this episode. The intro was by Home and the outro was by Son of Old. Follow Son of Old on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash son dash of dash old. That's S-U-N-O-F-O-L-D, Son of Old. Um, we've got the second installment of the Popular Front Synthline EP coming out soon. The um, you know We put some of the instrumentals that we use on the episodes and put them out. Uh, so yeah, keep your eyes on his SoundCloud for that. Thank you.